in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. For he, referring to Jesus, is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. By the way, that's the, that's the wall between Jews and Gentiles. It's teaching here that Jesus broke down the wall between Jews and Gentiles. How? By abolishing in his flesh the law of commandments and ordinances. All right. Now, Ephesians. Before we look at Ephesians, we're going to take a look at a couple of uh, prophecies from the Tanakh. Um, related to the other prophecy we looked at already from Jeremiah about the Old and New Covenants. We'll take a look at Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning in verse 15. The word, of the, the word of the Lord came to me, and you, O mortal, <laughs> O mortal, you, O mortal, take a stick and write on it. Of Judah and the Israelites associated with him, and take another stick and write on it. Of Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and all the house of Israel associated with him. Okay, so now... Uh, this is a talking about the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, Joseph was, uh, the house of Joseph is uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. So now he's saying of Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and the house of Israel associated with him. Bring them close together to each other so that they become one stick joined together in your hand. And when any of your people ask you, won't you tell us what these actions of yours mean? Answer them, thus says the Lord God, I'm going to take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel associated with him, and I will place the stick of Judah upon it, and make them into one stick, and they shall be joined in my hand. You shall hold up before their eyes the sticks which you have inscribed, and you shall declare to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to take the Israelite people from among the nations that they have gone to, and gather them from every quarter, and bring them to their own land, and I will make them a single nation in the land, on the hills of Israel, and one king shall be king of them all. Never again shall they be two nations, and never again shall, be, shall they be divided into two kingdoms. Nor shall they ever again defile themselves by their fetishes and their abhorrent things, and by their other transgressions. I will save them in all their settlements where they sinned, and I will cleanse them, then they shall be my people, and I shall be their God. Okay, does it say that it's going to take the stick of Israel? This is the Lost Ten Tribes stick. It's going to take the stick of Israel, and it's going to put them together into one stick called Judah? No, it's going to put them together into one stick called Israel. And they will have one king over them. Are they going to argue about, uh, you know, who's the king? Are they going to argue who's the greatest, who's the least? No. They're all going to agree they're going to have one king over them. Okay. So there's one prophecy. Now the next prophecy I want to take a quick look at. Hosea chapter 1. Now, Hosea was a prophet um, in the northern kingdom of Israel. And then uh, he, uh, because he continued to prophesy after the northern kingdom of Israel was taken away, he also prophesied to Judah. It says, The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, Hosea son of Beeri, in the reigns of the kings of Uzziah, 
Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So those four kings were right up until the um, the end of the uh, basically the beginning of the end of Jerusalem. But and it says, and the reign of King Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel. So he was the end of the northern kingdom, 721 B.C. It was probably a little bit earlier than that. When the Lord first spoke to Hosea, the Lord, the Lord said to Hosea, Go get yourself a wife of whoredom and children of whoredom, for the land will stray from following the Lord. So he went and married Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim. So what's Gomer? Gomer is a Gentile. She's um, uh, Gomer appears in the list of the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10. And Gomer is the, uh, Japheth was the firstborn of Noah. Gomer was the son, the firstborn son, I think, of Japheth. So he would be the firstborn son of the firstborn son of the Gentiles. So her name is Gomer. And she conceived and bore him a son, and the Lord instructed him, name him Jezreel. For I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the bloody deeds at Jezreel, and put an end to the monarchy of the house of Israel. In that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. So Jehu was uh, actually prophesied and sent by God to punish Jezebel and, and destroy the house of Ahab. But what he didn't do was he didn't take down the two sacred cows in Israel. He left them up. And that is the sin that brought Israel to ruin. Okay. She conceived again and bore a daughter and said to him, Name her Lo Ruhama, for I will no longer accept the house of Israel or pardon them. I will no longer pardon them, and I will no longer accept them. They're finished. But I will accept the house of Judah, and I will give them victory through the Lord their God. I will not give them victory with bow and sword and battle by horse and riders. After, <clears throat> so Judah will be restored, Israel will not. So Judah did, did go into captivity for 70 years and came back. Israel went into captivity and didn't come back. The northern kingdom of Israel. Okay, and uh, after weaning Lo-Ruhama, she conceived and bore a son. Then he said, Name him Lo-Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. So that's it. It's over. Okay, so after weaning Lo-Ruhama, she conceived and bore a son. Then he said, Name him Lo-Ami. For you are not my people, and I will not be your God. So that's over. It's the end. The number of the... Now in chapter 2, he starts, The number of the people of Israel shall be like that of the sands of the sea, which, sh which cannot be measured or counted. And instead of being told, You are not my people, they shall be called children of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel shall assemble together and appoint one head over them. So here they are joined together like the stick with one king. It's just like the new covenant. They, the, the Israel and Judah are no longer two. They are one. They are Israel. And they are together. So, and then, uh, and they shall rise from the ground, for marvelous shall be the day of Jezreel. O call your brothers my people, and your sisters lovingly accepted. So, 
there's the joining together into one nation, one Israel, under one king, David. Okay. Now, we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> and just with that sort of understanding of how the two are joined to one under one king, that is the prophecies from the Tanakh. There are, there are other prophecies like that, but we don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it. Okay, uh, now uh, we're going to skip over a lot of this. He talks a lot about Christianity, and then in chapter 2, starting in verse 11, we'll say, Wherefore remember that you being in the time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, so the Ephesians, they were Greek Gentiles, they weren't Jews, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. So the, the, circum, the circumcision, the Jews, called you uncircumcised. Okay? That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. So the God had the Jews, and they are circumcised. You are uncircumcised. You are not a part of Israel. You are without hope. You have no God in the world. You are hopeless. And uh, But now, in Christ Jesus, you, who at one time were far off, are made near by the, by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who has made both one. So now Paul's relating this to those prophecies. God has made both one under Christ, who is the son of David. Okay? He has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. There's no more circumcised and uncircumcised. That is broken. That's gone. That was dividing us, but we are no longer divided. We are now united. Having abolished in his flesh, remember he said Jesus condemned sin in the flesh. So sin is no longer um, he said the flesh, Jesus said the flesh is willing, or Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So he condemned the flesh. The flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It's the spirit that shall inherit. And we shall be given new flesh and new blood in the new kingdom. When you're raised up, in, in an immortal body, in the new heavens and new earth. So, um, this is what he's talking about. All right? So, he has made both one, circumcised and uncircumcised, all one in Christ, uh, because a lot of Jews became Christians and a lot of Gentiles became Christians. So, there's no difference between circumcised and uncircumcised. And he broke down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the en enmity, even the law of con content commandments contained in ordinances. This is this is a key in ordinances. So um, there are laws that are not ordinances, and there are laws that are ordinances. So he the the uh, the um, symbolic laws and the symbolic ritualistic things, including circumcision, that ended because that was prophecy. 
It's the prophecy is fulfilled. So that means that the prophecy is no longer prophecy. It's been fulfilled. Now it's history. Okay? That's how he abolished it. But it doesn't mean he abolished all of God's righteousness. He didn't abolish righteousness. He didn't abolish the definition of sin. Paul gets into that in detail on other parts, but I'm addressing the parts that uh, this rabbi is is addressing. Okay, he's he's using these arguments to try to say Paul got rid of the law. He didn't get rid of the law. He didn't get rid of the important parts of the law. He got rid of some of it, like the circumcision. Okay. To make, okay, having abolished in his flesh the en enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, in order to make in himself of the two one new man, so making peace. This is why he did it. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enemy thereby. He slew the enemy by the cross. And came and preached peace to you which were far off, and to them that were near. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now we've all heard that scripture, the stone the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That's Jesus. He's the chief cornerstone. The church is built. We are stones built upon that cornerstone. That is the church. In whom all the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. You are the temple of God. In whom you also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Because the Spirit of God dwells in you and dwells in, all, in us. And we are built on the foundation of Christ. We are the temple of God. God says, what house can you make for me? The, the heavens is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What house can you make for me? And that's his house. That's, that's the house that he made for himself. So that's what Ephesians is about. And finally, the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, quoting a passage in the book of Jeremiah, which speaks about God making a new covenant. So the author of Hebrews says, when he said a new covenant, he made the first one old. Now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. So you see that if the people in Jerusalem were suspicious of Paul, who did not seem to be a big Torah-observant dude, you see that Paul basically was teaching this very openly. From a Jewish point of view, listen carefully, this would be just about the greatest indictment of the New Testament. Why? Because we heard with our own ears, basically, Moses telling us, look, God is commanding you to keep the dietary laws, to observe Shabbat, to check your clothing for shotness. All the laws of the Jewish scriptures God commanded us. And now Paul is coming along, and Paul is saying, but I say to you, you don't have to do it anymore. So we would like, very justifiably say to Paul, why on God's wonderful earth should I believe a word that you're saying? If God spoke to the entire Jewish nation publicly and told us on Monday that we have to make sure we don't eat shrimp, and you, Paul, are telling us on Thursday, 
guess what? God told me to tell all of you, you can eat shrimp now. So why should we believe Paul? If Jeremiah told you on Monday, God sent his prophet Jeremiah to you on Monday, and he said, look, I'm going to do something new, not like I did with Moses. I'm going to do something completely new. And then uh, Paul came to you on Thursday and said, look, God is doing something new. Then why should you listen to Paul? Because Paul is telling you what the prophets have been telling you. That's why. And it doesn't mean Moses is pointless. Moses is not pointless. Uh, but God is doing something new. We'll take a look again at Jeremiah chapter 31 and just see what exactly is he saying here, okay? Is it something new? Like, what? where does this leave Moses? Jeremiah chapter 31, starting in verse 31. See, a time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Both of the houses of Israel and Judah. So this is after the house of Israel has gone. Jeremiah's preaching. The house of Israel has gone. And through Hosea he said they're not coming back. So this is a new Israel. And it's not a new Judah. It's the same Judah. New Israel. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, it will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, a covenant which they broke, though I espoused them, declares the Lord. It will not be like that covenant with Moses, but this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel, after those days. You notice there's no Judah now. It's one house. So Judah is in there, but it's one house now. It's the sticks joined together. It's the house of Israel. One house. I will put my teaching into their innermost being and inscribe it upon their hearts. Is this a spiritual house? This is a spiritual house. The Lord is living in their hearts. His, his law is in their hearts, written right on their hearts. This is a spiritual house, okay? Then I will be their God, and they shall be my people. He's quoting Hosea. They already had these prophecies. He's quoting that. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer will they need to teach one another and say to one another, Heed the Lord. For all of them, from the least to the greatest, shall heed me, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquities and remember their sins no more. So what part of this do you not understand? Or what law? What, who, who are you going to accuse of God's people? when he says he will remember their sins no, no more. Who, who's going to accuse them of something besides God? Their, their own conscience will convict them. We're, we're uh, um, you know, people who, are in, who have the knowledge of God are to teach them, not accuse them. Okay, so now let's take a quick look here. Another uh, verse, another scripture that will uh, point also to this new covenant. Isaiah chapter 66, starting Isaiah chapter 66, starting in verse 1. Thus says the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where could you build a house for me? Where? What place could serve as my abode? He's saying this while the first temple is still standing. It hasn't been destroyed during the time of Isaiah. It's still standing. It's sitting right there. And God's saying, 
Where would you build a house for me? Where? What place could serve as my house? All this was made by my hand. And thus it all came to being. I'm, I'm like everywhere. This is, I don't live in a house like you people live in houses. And he says, what does he say after that? Yet to such a one I will look, to the poor and brokenhearted who is concerned about my word. So those who listen to his words, this is who he will look to. So there's a, another scripture that sort of says, it, it talks about his throne and his temple. Where is God going to live? Is he going to live in your temple? He doesn't live in the temple. His presence was there, but it's not there now. That That is what, you know, is right in front of your face. What is in the temple? What is where the temple was? Um, you know, you're talking about keeping the law, every single law. Well, what about the temple? You can't. That's, you can't just forget about the temple and say you're keeping the law. You're not keeping the law, Moses, because that involves. Or where's your tent of meeting? Like there's got to be something. You can't just ignore half of what Moses said, and pick and choose what you feel like. So, you know, um, I don't know what you're trying to talk about with Paul. Paul is giving a very good explanation, very good uh, um, teachings about what is going on here. And uh, that's just the way it is. All right, let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 8 now. What does Paul say? Starting in verse 7. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. So now he's going to talk about Jeremiah, what we just read. It, if the first co covenant was faultless and nothing wrong with it, why would he seek a second covenant? Why would there be a different covenant not like the old one? What, if that was faultless, why would he want another one? Okay. For finding fault with them. Now remember, the fault wasn't with him. The fault was with them. And what does the new covenant say? I will write my laws in their hearts. It doesn't depend on them anymore. It depends only on God. And it's only for those who believe. When you believe, God will write his laws in your heart. Okay? For behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, says the Lord. That's probably the Septuagint. It, it has a different reading of things. Um, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. So there is Paul quoting Jeremiah, the very, very first, the very same verses that we read. And then Paul goes on to say, in that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first one old. That's true, he did. Because he said the new covenant will not be like that covenant. 
Now that which is decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. And how did it vanish away? Jesus fulfilled it. It's no longer a prophecy. It's, it's finished. It's fulfilled. But now the new covenant has taken place. So now he goes on. Okay. What does he go on to say? Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. The house that God doesn't. God had his presence there, but he doesn't live there. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had the manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubim of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. But into the second, into the most holy, the high priest alone went once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. This is the day of atonement, to atone for the sins of the nation. The Holy Ghost, thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest because only the one priest could go there. Nobody could look at it. It was not made manifest. While well, as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So as long as the first tabernacle was standing, that was um, not manifested to the people. Only uh, only in what they were told about it, not what they were shown about it. Which was a figure, prophecy, for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. It couldn't make his conscience perfect which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. And the time of reformation is the time when the new covenant was brought in, reformed. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, which is the, the believers are built upon Christ, which are like holy stones when the Spirit of God dwells within them, and they are his tabernacle. Not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us once for all time. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the puring of flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God? And... Um, it's not human sacrifice. It's self-sacrifice. Christ offered himself. And he said, come and follow me. So this is a much higher uh, uh, order of ser service. And there have been many, many martyrs.
just to bring this word of God to where it is now. And for this cause he is the mediator of a new testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal, of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For the testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator lives. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God has enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not, nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters into the holy place every year with the blood of others, for then must he have offered, then must he have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look to him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So that's, uh, you know, it's much deeper than what the rabbi is leading people to believe. He's not just sitting there and going talking against the law. He's talking, uh, he's teaching what the prophets teach about the new covenant that is different than the covenant under Moses. And it's the joining together of the two houses, Israel and Judah, into one house, Israel. And God does not live in buildings made of stone. He lives in his people.